think the biggest thing about it was that this is a woman, your partner, who did this. She never intentionally meant to kill him. A mistake happened, and she should have owned up to it and owned and owned it. Maybe she has anger issues because it's also one of those things that came up. Anger issues, you just got so angry to a point where you could not control yourself. It's not coming back. Blood is not coming back. He was Ngululeko to his father and the rest of his family, and Flaba to his fans. His star was definitely on the rise in the group squatter camp. He was also known as the so-called mayor of Gomorrah to his community in Alexandria. Until the 9th of March in 2015, when he died in his brother's arms after he was stabbed by his girlfriend, Usindisiwe Mangaile. She tried to allege a history of abuse in the relationship. When she was sentenced to 15 years in jail for the murder, there were still some questions for the people because they wanted to know what actually happened and why she decided to kill him. Twenty eighth of August two thousand and two, um, Guli was blessed with a baby that's cute, le sekhwa daddy, akiri pupu, and nakwatle nika wena because I'm mad about you. Isn't that cute? Flava the dad is most probably the best dad that I've ever seen. He was a loving dad, of course, a hands-on dad at that. A best friend, and not only a dad. He wasn't a very masculine dad, and I think that's what made him the perfect dad. He, 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 was, he was a very sensitive soul. He was, a soft, he was a soft person. Very emotional. He took family very very serious. He was a gentle giant, kind, very kind. I mean, he went all out for the people that were close to him, you know. He was honest. He really he told you how he felt. You know, if I was out of line, Nkuli was better. You know, um, he had the, uh, he was a funny dude, you know what I mean? Flava and Cindy met through me. Let me see, the year they met was probably 2006, 2007, uh, but there was no relationship at the time. Um, it was just all friends, chilling, you know what I mean, type of thing. And when it started, it was, what's it was Cindy and Motuaka? So I can't remember when that was, you know, and how long it actually was. I think I first met Cindy at Third Avenue, where my dad lived. Um, and it was very random. It wasn't really a planned thing that you're going to meet my girlfriend, but he kept on talking about Cindy and kept on showing me her pictures. And she was beautiful. She was stunning and she was, she had this um, calm aura and she was a very well-spoken and beautiful. <laughs> For the most part, I just admired her beauty. Look, honestly speaking, their relationship was all flowers, was all, was all roses and daisies. It was funny, it was joyful to watch. You know what I mean? It was, it was a good relationship. For the most part, if you look at it from the outside, it was exciting and it was, also refreshing because I feel like for my dad, he was really invested into that relationship and I think so was she. Got to the sands, we got a corner, chilled. The hosts came through, greeted us. Some friends were there. We chilled, we got drinks, 
people coming through, greeting us. I think JR's girlfriend, who was uh, Flava's ex-girlfriend, came through, she greeted us. And there was, and I think Peter's wife as well, came through, greeted us as well. So she felt some type of way about that, especially with JR's girlfriend. With, she's your ex and you're letting her come through, giving you the hugs and all of that, you know? And then, yeah, it was just like chill, like relax, you know what I mean? It's just a friendly, friendly thing, you know? And when we were leaving, and she was talking to some dudes at the gate, to like, yo, let's go. And then she went back, she's like, you're busy entertaining other women, and the next thing I'm talking to dudes, and you know, now it's time to go. They were walking ahead of me, going to the car. And she was busy arguing, she was busy swearing, and saying, <laughs> saying a whole lot of stuff, you know. Nah, you can't tell me what to do. If I wanna talk to men, I'll talk to men, you know. Okay, and then we basically sat on the on the corner while I went to go fetch the car, which wasn't parked pretty far. Fetch the car, came back, we got in the car, we went to McDonald's. Uh, she was busy just going on and on and on, you know. And then after that, from McDonald's, we drove home. They dropped me off. Taban called me. And it took 15 to 30 minutes. I got the call 15 to 30 minutes after I was dropped off. And Abuti. I'm like, what do you mean? So I'm thinking, maybe he fell, or you know what I mean? Sindu kawatile, ngul, flava. What are you talking about, dude? It's like he's dead, bro. I think the biggest thing about it was that this is a woman, your partner, who did this. We usually, we used to the man, the men killing the women, and now he's the other way around, and it's not just anyone. It's, 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 the whole thing was just, I can't say shocking. It was just one of those things that you never really get used to even today. That, that day is still a bit of a, still of a blur, man, because I got there and it was still lying there and I left. And I think I came back when I was six, seven in the morning. So when it comes to intimate partner violence in, uh, throughout the world, not just in South Africa, it's typically going to be your male offenders who are most of the time who are committing these types of acts. But the definition does not exclude, uh, in terms of gender-based violence or intimate partner violence, does not exclude the female offender on female on female or female on male uh, offenders, um, it would still be regarded as gender-based violence. She stated that there was a squabble or some fight, because uh, then she had to explain why she had um, some scratches on her torso. After Cindy and Flabber got home, the couple got into a fight. The altercation turned violent when Cindy stabbed Flabber in the chest, allegedly with the intent to get him away from her. She maintains that she stabbed him, but did not intend to kill him. The most common weapon used by females when they murder an intimate partner is actually a knife. The courts would look at the circumstances, because it's very easy to say, well, I fired a shot at you, but I didn't mean to kill you. And the court would probably look at it and say, but that is a lethal weapon. If I know there's a possibility, a reasonable possibility that stabbing this person could lead to their death, and I decide to proceed with that action anyway, you could still charge them with, with the intent being dolus eventualis, instead of I'm going to directly kill you now and stab you till that is over. The courts would still regard them both as a form of murder. So um, unfortunately, even if that was really not your intention to kill the person, you are playing with a lethal weapon in a very serious way. And you know, you'll unfortunately have to accept those consequences. You would never really see them fight. You would see them argue a little bit, but like five minutes later, they're all lovey-dovey. So there was no signs at all. That's why it was such a shock.
following um, the stabbing, uh, he was then saying that she stabbed me and then the family came in to try to help. Paramedics were called, help was called, and then they came in. As soon as the, 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 um, the paramedics were, were there and they declared him dead at, at, at the scene, um, Cindy broke a uh, is said to have broken a bottle, a beer bottle, and slit her wrist. Uh, but then the paramedics were able to kind of uh, stop her from from doing more harm to herself. We do have uh, homicide suicides in South Africa. They're not uncommon. Uh, it is uncommon, though, that we have a female committing the murder and then trying to commit suicide after. One actually thinks about how the family had to actually listen and hear everything that happened that evening and how it eventually ended. I think that's actually quite sad that you, you know, listen to people screaming and shouting and then it ends up like that. It's just one of those things that I think it's going to bother them because then you were part of it from we heard the screams, we heard the shouting and, you know, the banging on the door and now she stabbed me and now he's no longer with us. So I, besides the fact that he's dead, um, how do you now live or continue having to have listened to the whole thing? The last time that I had talked to um, Cindy and my dad was over the phone. Um, probably because he passed away Sunday, if I'm not mistaken. I talked to him on Thursday, and they both told me that they love me and they miss me and they're going to come see me next week. That was all. Um... I think if he, had, if he suffered a minor injury, he would have checked. He would have left and be like, I, this woman is crazy. You know, I would have left. At the same time, he loved her, man. You know, she loved her, you could have even forgiven her. I would say that I knew that my dad passed away before they even told me because I had felt like something was wrong that day, something was missing. I still remember the day of the funeral. I was very packed. It was at a stadium in Alex. Um, he was he was loved, and I think what people loved about him was that he was relatable. He was not just the squatter camp uh, star or, or you know the artist, but he was that guy that everyone related to, and they loved how he is Wana Mukasi. Um, he still had that about him. So um, it was a shock to many, and like I said, um, it's, it's always a shock when someone that young passes on, and not just in any, you know, sometimes you get sick, but he was killed. So obviously when a high-profile figure in a community passes away, it, it impacts beyond just the immediate family that you would normally expect in any kind of case where there's a murder. But unfortunately what I've seen in South Africa is that we're very good to have these very strong emotional outbursts, which are justified, and marches and issues and etc. and nothing actually changes. Our laws don't change, our policing doesn't get better, the crimes still continue in our communities, and that's kind of one of the sad things, that uh, we can go through multiple names of intimate partners who were murdered by their, by their, by their ex or current spouse, um, or very gruesome murders of women that raise issues of gender-based violence, and if you go back and list the names, we'll all recognize them. We forget them, uh, but they will be recognized, and nothing's actually changed since the last one. She spoke about how jealous Flabber was. Um, and how physical he sometimes got with her. Um, something that others also refuted. So there was not really any evidence of that really happening. I remember he used to say, why should I be jealous of people who want what I have? They should be jealous of me. There was no, not even a single person who came and said, yes, I've seen Cindy. Flava used to abuse or be physical with her. 
Um, it is possible that people can be wonderful, kind, supportive people to the rest of society, their children, family, friends, etc., and only be abusive to their partners, that they have their romantic partners. Absolutely, that does happen. And then it would very much fall down to where's the proof of some kind of a history that Flubber engaged in this behavior towards Cindy? Did she tell friends? Did she open up a case? Which, of course, we know a lot of people don't open up cases, but did she at least tell friends? Did friends notice wounds and injuries? Did friends notice a change in her behavior? Did she become more withdrawn? Did we see him isolating her from her friends and support mechanisms once the abuse did start? And those are the kind of things that obviously a proper investigation would uh, have to look into. But again, it would be more relevant when it comes to the sentencing. It is my unpleasant task to impose the following sentence on you. You are hereby sentenced to a period of 12 years imprisonment. 15 years, three years suspended, eligible for parole after you eight years, but then she had to go through a series of um, programs that she had to go through, anger management and so forth. Personally, no, it's not fair. You know, I mean, you're gonna come back and live your life. It's not coming back, Flav is not coming back. I feel like she was remorseful. I didn't feel like she, I don't feel like it was intentional. I, I don't feel like it was a full on um, ooh, mistake, it's a knife, but I also don't feel like it was intentional. So I feel like she was remorseful and she still is. For me, remorse is I stabbed you and I'm sorry and I sh sh this should not have happened. But the minute I start adding excuses, yeah, because he, he's abusive, or he was on top of me and now I wanted him to get off. Um, yes, that might be what happened, but you're making excuses and you are not taking accountability for your actions and that's what I got from her. Being remorseful comes with, 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 admitting what you have done. She never did. As you know, I mean, she came out and she said self-defense. So you can't be remorseful when you lying about something, you know? We, I mean, I I've, think I've said it so many times that I think it would, she never intentionally meant to kill him. A mistake happened and she should have owned up to it and owned and owned it. I think the results would be different today, you know, for her, that is. Maybe she has anger issues because it's also one of those things that came up. Anger issues, you just got so angry to a point where you could not control yourself. But then the minute you start having excuses, are you really sorry? I think if he, had, if he suffered a minor injury, he would have checked. He would have left and be like, I, this woman is crazy. You know, and would have left. At the same time, he loved her, man. You know, she loved her, you could have even forgiven her. I did go to court once. I don't know if she noticed me when I was walking behind her entering court. I don't know if she saw me, but I could, because I know her scent. That's how close we were. I wasn't allowed in court because uh, as, a, as a witness, I wasn't allowed inside because I couldn't hear people's testimonies and stuff, so I couldn't see her. But when I eventually went in, she was always face down. Um, at some point, she was in tears here and there. I think maybe hearing testimonies, I don't, I, I don't know. You, could, you couldn't really tell what she was actually going through. She was always face down, covered in a, in a scarf. Last year in 2020, I went to see Cindy in prison. I, I wouldn't say that I went there for closure because I'm never gonna be okay with what happened. I went there specifically to talk to her as somebody that was in my life. I feel like it wasn't about my dad, me going to Cindy. It was about me and her because I obviously don't have a father anymore. So my family dynamic 
education and my whole living situation as a whole, because I was obviously in a bit of school before. I'm still dealing. I'm still dealing. I haven't dealt with it, I'm still dealing with it. You know, you lose somebody so close, I mean, somebody you shared everything with, you know? We, we shared the little that we had. Uh, we did a lot of things together, you know? It's, it's a tough one to actually know what There isn't anybody that you're gonna be so close to. And it's not easy to share with people, you know? The stuff that we shared. I mean, personally, emotionally, Financially, you know what I mean? Our struggles, we struggle together, we, we hustle together, you know what I mean? I want his legacy to be um, spoken through me and my words and my creativity. That's how I want it to be. Because if we're being honest, see, me and my brother are what the earth has left of Flava. legacy will stand the test of time through the bloodline of brotherhood and the seeds that you left behind go bar baby mm -hmm. a few weeks after filming drum behind the headlines Ngunulego Chauke passed away our condolences to his friends and family <laughs>